Welcome to Numerical Methods. Yeah, today I maybe we take a small break from the Numerical Methods and I would like to talk a little bit more about implementation. Um, yeah, so one part of this course is that I would like to teach you a little bit good programming style. Yeah, so how you should design your program, how you should implement your uh, numerical method. And uh, to some extent, this is also now a summary of what we did so far. Yeah? So what we did so far was uh, we discussed computer arithmetic. Yeah? And there inside was, for example, uh, the Kahan summation yeah? that uh, reduces the rounding errors that accumulate when you sum a large number of uh, values, like we do in the Monte Carlo uh, method. Yeah? So that was the next thing. Monte Carlo method, how to approximate an expectation of a random variable. Yeah, to generate that random variable, we needed random numbers. So we discussed random number generation. First, there were the uniforms, yeah, which then gave us the Monte Carlo integration. Yeah, but then also we learned how to generate other distributions, inversion of the distribution function, which we maybe need to generate a Brownian increment of a Brownian motion. Uh, so we were applying the Monte Carlo method with our random number generators to time discrete stochastic processes. Well, time discrete stochastic processes is just a vector of random variables where the random variables are associated with certain times. So that was the time discrete stochastic process. And the next step was then that we uh, had a method to approximate a time continuous stochastic process, so an SDE, by a time discrete stochastic process. So we were talking about time discretization of stochastic processes. So now we have many numerical methods that we can combine to build, for example, larger Monte Carlo valuation models for our application, say, for example, derivative valuation yeah, in mathematical finance. So we have a financial product where we would like to calculate the fair value, the risk neutral valuation, which is an expectation of maybe some payoff function yeah, or some complicated thing like the Asian option where you do an averaging of past observation of the time discrete stochastic process. The time discrete stochastic process then is a model, a model for what you observe on the market. So how should you choose your model? When If it is an SDE, DS is mu dt plus sigma dw, how do you have to choose mu and sigma and so on? So first let me make some uh, general remarks. So what is uh, the intention? And then I will discuss a little bit this application. Yeah, what we have done so far in our programming experiments yeah, was just writing a single code that illustrated this experiment. And then I have thrown it away. Yeah, I have rarely reused code. Yeah, okay, that's not completely true. We wrote, for example, an interface for one-dimensional random number generator. We implemented this interface yeah, by different random number generators, say the Mersenne twister, the Van der Korput sequence, and so on. And then later I reused them in some other application. And this is the route I would like to go now yeah, and yeah, introduce more reusable components. So I would like to create some kind of abstraction of our uh, mathematical concepts that we have developed so far. The most important tool in creating this abstraction is the interface. So I would like to define interfaces yeah, for these mathematical concepts. So recall the interface is just a description what can be done with an object of a class that is implementing this interface. Yeah. So it is a kind of blueprint, but it just specifies the method, yeah, the things that can be done, and it does not specify how this is implemented, how it is done. This specification of the how it is done is in the class. Yeah. You can have different implementation, different ways of 
doing it, yeah, by providing different classes, implementing this interface. So the first step is that we would like to design some interfaces. We already did this during the course, for example, for the random number generator 1D for our random number sequence, because we reuse this in different contexts. So you already learned this a little bit. The question in specifying the interface is, yeah, where to cut the boundaries? Yeah. So what should be the responsibility of this guy? Yeah? It just provides a random number. Yeah? So our interface for the random number generator 1D was just a single function, give me the next random number. Or should it maybe provide more functionality? For example, our n-dimensional random number generator provided a vector of the a random sample, but it also provided the dimension, of course. Yeah, So you have to specify a little bit what is provided by a class implementing this interface. So we would like to cut at the right boundaries. And this then relates to, say, two principles. The first one is the single responsibility principle. And maybe you can look this up. There's, for example, a nice description on Wikipedia. Okay. The single responsibility principle. Yeah, there are different ways of defining it. Here it says a module should be responsible to one and only one actor. So actor is maybe now my understanding of somebody who likes to do something uh, with this. Yeah? So he likes to have random numbers. So the class implementing this interface should not be responsible for too many things. Yeah? So this principle goes in the direction that I would like to have smaller parts, each having a single responsibility. Yeah, but there is another aspect. We should question maybe which things belong together. Yeah? And this aspect is called cohesion. Yeah? So Certain things depend on each other, and maybe they have to be close to each other in the implementation. Maybe they have to be maintained by the same class. A nice example for this uh, cohesion in our application of mathematical finance is if you have now a class that provides the model for an SDE, then the for providing the drift mu and providing the numerea for the model should be maybe in the same class. Yeah, why is that? Because the SDE is simulated under a certain measure. Yeah? And this measure Q depends on the numerea. So we should provide the numerea and the drift by the same object, maybe. Yeah. Because Gesanov theorem tells me how the drift looks like under a chosen measure that is under a chosen numerea. So if you place these two mathematical things in two different classes, yeah, far away in your program, it can happen that somebody modifies the, the calculation of the numerea. So somebody moves, for example, an interest rate model from spot numerea to terminal bond numerea. But then this would impact how the drift is calculated. So maybe this is how your SDE generates the stock using the certain drift. Yeah? And there has to be communication between these things. So there should be maybe close, maybe it should be just one class, maybe it should go both in the model. So this is what I, for example, have later. We have a class that is a model for the SDE. And this model for the SDE provides the drift and the numerea. So somebody can change the numerea, but then this class also provides the changed drift. 
So when creating these components, yeah, we should maybe check which things belong belong together. Yeah, um, what I present is just an example. Yeah, uh, there is no right and wrong. Yeah, sometimes you can move the boundary a little bit to the left. Yeah, so have finer components. Sometimes you can move it a little bit to the right, so have more monolithic. Yeah, more larger components. And sometimes you observe later in your programming yeah, that you would like to change something and you have to cut again or you have to merge again or you have to rearrange uh, your interface definition. That that can happen. So it's just an example that I give, but I would like to teach you a little bit the principles. Another thing which I would like to highlight is that we should design our implementation for extension. And this is also where it becomes important that you are not only a good programmer, that you are also a good mathematician, or vice versa, that you are not only a good mathematician, but you are also a good programmer. Because in order to understand how a future extension would look like, yeah, or, or which potential future extensions there could be, you have to understand a little bit the mathematics behind this. So we should consider possible generalization. And a nice example for this is maybe also our SDE. So our SDE has a drift and a diffusion parameter, though the coefficients. So maybe you note that Black-Scholes looks like that. Okay, so here sigma is a constant. Maybe we could generalize it allow some function of S, yeah? but um, this is just the model for a stock for an interest rate. Actually, the drift would look different. Yeah? For example, for a forward rate in LIBOR market model, the drift would look different. So we would have here maybe something more general, maybe a mu that depends on T and S. Okay. And then it could happen that the volatility parameter is stochastic. So maybe this guy here is not necessarily a deterministic function of S. Yeah? It could be a stochastic process on its own. So maybe I should consider this. So this would then be a model with a stochastic volatility. So in other words, we should maybe consider that this object here is allowed to be a random variable. So later we can replace this random variable that depends on time by a time discrete stochastic process, which is, for example, a Heston model, yeah, a model with stochastic volatility. But in the beginning, this random variable is maybe just a constant yeah, or a constant times S, yeah, which is also a random variable. Okay, so I would like to design my program a little bit for extension. So I make it a little bit more general than uh, the than what is needed yeah, for my current problem. And this generalization, yeah, it has to be done with a little bit of foresight, yeah, what could come in the future. Of course, my code should be readable and concise. So uh, self-documenting yeah, is, is the best. Maybe you already saw this when I choose my variable names. Yeah, I have quite long variable names. I like to choose the variable names not like a mathematician would maybe do it X, Y, Z, P, Q, R, T, S. Yeah. So sometimes I do this for the obvious guys. Yeah. Time, for example, um, or in my just in my little illustrative um, experiments, I sometimes do this. But when I program something, yeah, that is part of a larger context. I try to use variable names that really explain what the variable is doing. Yeah, For example, time to maturity as a variable name. So I also like to teach you a little bit coding style, good coding style. Yeah, I will illustrate these aspects now. 
yeah, with uh, two examples. First one is valuation of a European call option under the Black Schultz model. Second one is the simulation of the Euler scheme. So, for example, that we can value more complicated financial products like an Asian option under a Black Schultz model and so on. First application valuation of a European option under the Black Scholz model. So let's shortly review my application. So I would like to value a financial derivative. So my financial derivative is a European option. So I know the value at a future point in time. So this is here. The V yeah, at a future point in time, capital T, I know this value as a function of the underlying stock. Yeah, So this function is given here. It is maximum of the underlying stock, yeah, then minus K and zero. Okay. So the input is here, the underlying stock value. So this value if I have calculated it, is then multiplied with the numerair ratio, my discount factor, so the numerair today and the numerair at the payment time. And then we take the uh, expectation. Yeah, So here it is conditional expectation, conditional to time t uh, of this value. So you can write this as taking the expectation of a function the function G, the function G describing the payoff of your financial derivative. So this is the financial product. So the green stuff is the financial product. The financial product function G depends on model quantities, the value of the stock at the future time and the value of the numeraire at the future time. So I need to generate these two model quantities. So my model quantities are now modeled by a black Scholz model. Well, numeraire is easy. In the black Scholz model, you, know, you just have Bn is R N D T. Yeah, so I have a continuously compounding interest rate R, yeah, and my uh, initial value is some n0 yeah, for, could, for example, be b1. The model for the stock is now a log normal one. So I have ds is rs dt plus sigma s dw. So you know that you can explicitly solve this by going to the logarithm, which will remove the s, yeah, but give you this part here, minus one half sigma squared from Ito's lemma. Then you have a constant coefficient, SDE, you can integrate it. So I have immediately that the logarithm of S of capital T is the logarithm of S of zero, integrate the other stuff. So R capital T minus one half sigma squared capital T sigma w of t. So here, the w is another part yeah, that is special. Yeah. It is my Brownian motion. So my Brownian motion, yeah, I know this is normal distributed random variable here. This means zero and standard deviation yeah, square root of the time step. So here is square root of capital T. I just have an European option. So I can write my Brownian motion W of T as square root of T times some standard normal Z. Yeah? So now I have a standard normal distributed Z here. And you see again, that also your model is just a function of some random variable, now your standard normal. So my model is then just S is S in zero. Yeah, so I took the exponential now. So multiplied with the exponential, RT minus one half sigma squared, square root of T times Z. Yeah, so that's now my model, which is a function of the 
set. Well, my um, my model is actually creating a vector, yeah, um, because I need the value of the stock at capital T and the value of the Nomarea ratio at capital T. So look back, my product actually depended here on two components, the value of the stock and the value of the ratio of the Nomarea. And I need to generate these uh, two components here for my valuation. So that's now my, my model. Input is a standard normal, random variable, and out I get these two model quantities. And now we can plug in this into my financial product valuation. And I have that the value of the derivative today is the expectation. So actually here, this is conditional to zero. There should be a zero here. Okay. Is the expectation of apply the payoff function G to the vector generated by your model, given your risk driver, given the standard normal Z. And for that, we do now the Monte Carlo method. So we generate uh, samples of this Z. Uh, so I generated here normal distributed random numbers. So I sampled this set and I just apply. Yeah. So I just map the functions yeah, and then take, take the average. Let's have a look at code doing this, where we use our Mersenne Twister yeah, uh, to calculate this Monte Carlo approximation here. Okay, so you find this code in our lecture repository in Monte Carlo evaluation. Yeah, it is called Monte Carlo Black Scholes Call Option Experiment. So you see, I have a one here. Huh? I will do a second part. Yeah, so first let's do it in the way we have done before, maybe structure the code a little bit better. So this is here in Monte Carlo valuation. This is this code. So I need to define yeah, some constant, some quantities. Yeah? So this here is my model. Yeah? These are the model parameters. The initial value of the stock is 100. The R, the risk-free rate, the interest rate is 5%. The volatility is 20%. Then I need to define some product parameters. So what is the option I would like to value? So my option maturity capital T is one and my option strike is 105. If I would like to simulate a time discrete stochastic process, I would have to specify a time discretization. But here I only need two time points, the starting time point, which is zero, we start in zero, and the end time point, which is the capital T, which is one. So I just have a single time step. But since I would like to go to more general cases later, yeah, I would say my time discretization here is just this time discretization, one time step starting in zero. And the delta T is just equal to, to one. So then I need some parameters for my Monte Carlo simulation, the seed for my random number generator, and the number of sample paths. And here you also have another parameter, number of factors, because I would like to design for extension. And I already have in my mind that in some applications, the Brownian motion could be vector valued. Yeah? So actually, these are two different increments, dw1, dw2. These are two components of a vector w, w1, w2. So Black Scholes is just a model that has a single scalar Brownian driver here. So the number of factors is equal to one. So that would be my number of factors. So I have different versions of this experiment, yeah, which we will uh, 
yeah, look at from time to time. I just like to have a look at the first uh, two ones. So using the loop and using this Java stream. So let's maybe comment these guys here out. Okay, and then have a look at different implementations. So I'm calling here some method, get analytic value, get Monte Carlo value using loop, get Monte Carlo value using stream. I report the time that was required for the calculation and I report the value. So the first thing I would like to do is calculate the analytic value from the Black-Scholes formula. Yeah? So I know the analytic benchmark, so you can compare pair that we don't do something wrong. Okay, there's an analytic formula hidden here inside. Yeah, you can peek inside. And it's just the usual formula yeah, with some uh, limit cases uh, implemented here. Okay, so the first thing I would like to discuss with you is the Monte Carlo valuation yeah, using just a classical for loop. So what do we do? I initialize my random number generator that generates now the samples. Then I initialize my sum for my Monte Carlo sum. I loop over all these samples. I take the uniform random number. I convert the uniform random number to a normal distributed random number. So now we have the Z here. This is my standard normal. So now my next step is generate out of this normal distributed random number, the stock value S of T. So that's the first component of my function H that is here the H1. Okay, so you see that's just the H1. S0 multiplied with exponential of R T minus one half sigma squared T plus sigma times square root of T times Z. That's my generation of the model quantity S. Then I calculate the payoff. Yeah? So that's the maximum of S minus K and zero. So that's here this part inside. Then I multiply the payoff with the numeraire. So that's the discounted payoff. And I add this to my sum. Take the average, that's the value. Okay, so that's straight, but you see that everything is a little bit clued together. Yeah, of course, you see a little bit the difference. You have first here the model, but then the payoff, then here again, the discounting. Everything is a little bit glued together. The random number generator, a loop around it. If you use uh, the Java stream RP and uh, maybe also use uh, double unary operators. So if I just really define now these functions here, this H, and this G, then the code already looks a little bit cleaner. So that's the next one. That's Monte Carlo value using streams. So I just define my model. My model is a function that maps the risky driver, so my Brownian increment, my normal distributed Z, yeah, standard normal, to the value of S. Yeah? So this here is the map Z maps to S of capital T. So little Z maps to initial value exponential RT minus one half sigma squared T plus sigma square root of T times Z. This is just the operator. Then comes my financial product, yeah? my discounted payoff. Yeah? So take the ratio of the numeraire and take the model quantity of S and can generate the payoff. So this maps S of T to V of T. The discounted payoff, actually V of T times N of zero divided N of T. So the discounted payoff um, so this maps S to maximum of S minus K and zero. Yeah? 
multiplied with the ratio of the numeraria, so discounted, so times e to the minus rt. So you see, if you would like to change the model for S, yeah, you change this function. If you would like to change the financial product, say, instead of a call option, you could create a put option and so on, you change this function. It's a little bit separating model and product. So now my numerical method looks like this. Generate the random number generator. From the random number generator, generate a sequence of uniforms and then I just have transformations. The first one is take the uniform sequence and transform it using the inversion of the distribution function to a normal distributed sequence. Next step, take the normal distributed sequence, so this is the things that sample Z, and transform it using the model to a sequence of samples of S. Yeah? So this is the sequence of samples of the underlying stock value. Then take the underlying stock value and transform it to payoff values, samples of the samples of the payoff functions. Yeah? So again, use map. Yeah? Map is just applying this function to the sequence to get a new sequence. Then I have the sequence of these samples and we just take this sum and divide by n, so we just take the average. So take the sum and divide by n. Actually, here inside the sum, it uses uh, Kahan uh, summation. Yeah? So you see this here in the documentation, yeah? implemented using compensated summation or other techniques to reduce the error. Okay, so let's uh, maybe just run this little program and we see three different values. And you also see slight difference in the Monte Carlo valuation. This is just because what I just mentioned that this summation here uses error correcting summation, Kahan summation, while here above, yeah, we did not do this. Yeah, and you see I'm quite close to the two analytic solution, yeah, we have 2 to the power of uh, 2 times 10 to the power of 7 sample paths, yeah, so take the square root, so error should be a 10 to the minus 3 yeah, or 4, yeah? so value of the option is a 10, yeah, so this is a 10 to the minus 3 or 4, yeah? that's okay. So, um, yeah, here we just have a loop over uh, the Monte Carlo samples. So maybe you recall the experiments we did where we valued an Asian option. So that was on the section on Monte Carlo simulation of time discrete stochastic processes. So it was here for Monte Carlo E2 process. And you see that there we actually had yeah, a double loop, loop over all samples, and then we looped over all time steps yeah, to simulate our Asian option. So you see that we very often need different things. We need random variables that are just created in loops where we always do the same stuff. Yeah? So here you have a loop and for every element you really do the same stuff. And we need time discretizations. Yeah? time discretizations, and for the time discretization, I sometimes need, okay, I need the time that belongs to an index, but I also need to calculate the time step. Sometimes I need to find an index for a certain time, so that could happen. So what I would like to do is now create, say, reasonable interface definitions for these objects, for, for the time discretization, for the concept of a random variable, and then time discretization and normal distributed random variable, so IID normals, they will build the Brownian motion. So let's build the Brownian motion. First thing that often appears here is the time discretization, so specifying different time points. You know? 
time discretization then appears here inside a stochastic process to form a family of then random variables. Good example is the Brownian motion or more important for us, the Brownian increments. The Brownian increments are random variables. So the next object that is of interest to us is a random variable. And as in my little program here, you see that when we operate on random variable, when we operate on random variables, we often have pathwise operation. Yeah, You see, I have a loop over the sample path here, but this sample index, this variable here, does not appear here. So what we do inside does not depend on which omega I am. So all these things here are pathwise operators. So very often we are confronted with pathwise operators. So if you have an operation between two random variables, yeah, so Z is, say, some operator applied to X and Y, yeah, then this operation is defined uh, pathwise. Yeah? So Z of omega is X of omega with this operator and Y of omega. So we have that this operator here is then lifted yeah, to the random variables. So, for example, I would like to have element-wise uh, or pathwise addition of two random variables, subtraction, multiplication, division, and so on. Yeah? There are some operators which are not pathwise. So an example for an operator that is not pathwise that actually has to use multiple samples is the expectation or the conditional expectation. So maybe we could create an interface for a random variable that provides all these methods here. So I can add two random variables, I can subtract two random variables and so on. Inside we have an implementation where we just iterate with this loop. But then on the outside, it looks as if we operate on the random variable and I can actually get rid of this loop here and I can just write yeah, uh, maximum of the stock value minus k and zero yeah. as a function on the random variable. Also, for the time discretization, there are some functions yeah, that are handy to us. So often I need give me the time step size for a given time index. Yeah? So I need sometimes the map that maps i to delta ti. So the delta ti is ti plus one minus ti. Or what I also sometimes need is I have a time, give me the nearest index i, where, where the time is less or equal that time. Yeah? So maybe I can have an interface for time discretizations and then a class or classes that implement these handy functions and also handy ways to construct a time discretization. So I just tell him, this is the initial value, this is the time step size, and I would like to have so many time steps. Or this is the in initial value, this is the end value, and I would like to have 100 time steps, and so on. So speaking of time discretization and random variables, yeah, this is a time discrete stochastic process. And the time discrete stochastic process that we are often confronted with or that we often need well, to build then uh, other ethos stochastic processes is the Brownian motion, yeah? especially the Brownian increment. But now note that in some more complicated models, the model quantities are driven by a multifactorial Brownian motion. So I have different independent Brownian increment in a single time step. So this is called then how many factors do we have? So this would be an M factorial 
Brownian motion. So the M now referring to that I have a vector of Brownian increments with M entries. So here are just my scalar Brownian increments. Okay, they, for, they form now a vector valued Brownian increment over these time steps. Yeah, so these delta W, J, T, I, they are mutually independent and normal distributed with mean zero and standard deviation square root of delta uh, T, I. So you see, I have an index I that refers to the time discretization point, the time step, and I have an index J that now refers to the entry in this vector. So if I create now my interface, I would like to design it for extension. I will, from the beginning, design it as an M factorial Brown in motion, where you can specify I would like to have M components. You know how to generate samples of random vectors. If you have, for example, something like Mesin Twister, a pseudo-random number generator, you just populate the entries one after the other, yeah? uniform, transformed to normal, and so on. But often we will just use it with number of factors equal to one. So let's start and discuss a few of these interfaces and um, implementation. So I will just review with you now the interface random variable, the interface time discretization, and then the interface Brownian motion. So I have definitions of these interfaces and implementations of these interfaces here in our library in FinMatLib. So this is what we will study now. And once we have understood a little bit of the concepts, we will also use it to build more complicated things. We have nicer numerical experiments. And somewhere down here in this package, you find the interface of a random variable. So um, my random variable, since I often use random variables that are associated with stochastic processes, my random variable can provide the time that it is associated with. Yeah? So for example, the filtration time, so saying this random variable is associated with this time, so it is at least measurable with respect to f, T with this T. So this is maybe just a detail. Um, more interesting are that we now have many different arithmetic operations. You can add a floating point number to this random variable. You can add another random variable to this random variable. You can subtract the floating point number from this random variable, subtract another random variable from it multiply a floating point number, multiply two random variables, division, divide. And functions we often need, like apply the exponential to this random variable. So you see no argument, just creates the exponential. Or apply a floor with a given value. So this will implement maximum of this random variable value and the given floor. Could also be a random floor value, which is actually just a function maximum of this random variable and the given argument yeah, is returned. So maybe we just look into these functions. So exponential, this will generate a new random variable with the result of the function. So I have a comment on this later. So I implement here immutable objects. So we do not modify this random variable, which is here. We create the result as a new random variable. So if you apply s dot exponential, we actually get a result yeah, that is the exponential of s. So you have to write z equals s dot exponential. So this is now our interface. Uh, let's have a look at implementations of this interface. So now you see there are many different implementations. Okay, oh, 
I have many implementations. Maybe to just look here at these two. There is one that uses floating point double and one using floating point single precision. So let's look at the floating point double one. So you see the data model is basically just the vector of the realizations of this random variable. So these are just my, my samples. But uh, now remember that I would like to design for extension. So I would like to use the random variable also in places where we actually have a constant. You know? For example, like in the Black schultz model, the sigma, I could use a random variable, but in the Black schultz model, the sigma is a constant. So this would be really a waste of memory and also of calculation power, of, cal of calculation time, if we always iterate through a vector that is a constant. So I do a little trick. So this array here, this can be null, so I did not allocate memory. And in cases where this is null, this is just the value that is describing this constant. If I do this trick, this makes then the implementation a little bit more complicated. Because now take a look at what happens if I add a number to this random variable. So this is now my function that generates a new random variable by adding a constant to this random variable. So then if this is a deterministic random variable, I just have a new deterministic random variable, which is this value plus the given argument. But if this thing is not deterministic, I have to iterate over all samples and add this number to the sample vector at the corresponding component and generate out of this vector here a new random variable. So you see that this makes my implementation a little bit more complicated. And you find this pattern now here in every function that I will check, is this deterministic, then just add the two values, otherwise do the loop. Um, this uh, if statement here doesn't cost a lot of time. Yeah? Actually, uh, these virtual machines are optimized in a very good way. They have branch prediction. Yeah, They actually do the stuff uh, and guess that they do not need to do the other branch. Yeah? Uh, so this doesn't cost a lot of time. Yeah? But of course, it will save a lot of time if I do not do the loop, yeah? if I have a deterministic random variable. So this little implementation trick allows me now to use a random variable in many different cases, even where it is a constant. The funny thing is that on the outside, I don't see this. Because on the outside, I just have I just have these functions, yeah? Add a constant to this random variable, and he will take care of how it is done. Yeah. So you see again the difference between interface and class. Yeah. I can add a constant to this random variable and get a new random variable. But how it is done is implemented here, uh, and I could have had a different implementation. This implementation is using here an array that is floating point double. I have another implementation of this interface, which is here. And if you go to this implementation, you see that here I'm using an array that is floating point single position. position. So if you have, say, one million uh, sample paths, yeah, a floating point double has eight bytes. This will be eight megabytes. Yeah, a, fl a single position floating point number has only four bytes, 32 bits. Yeah, this will be four megabytes. Yeah. So it will be a, a little bit uh, cheaper in terms of uh, memory, but maybe you lose um, accuracy. For Monte Carlo, losing the accuracy is not such a big deal because we will average all these guys. And if we average these guys in a floating point double precision, some, yeah, so maybe the rounding errors of the individual values yeah, do, do not play a role. So speaking of averaging, how is calculating the average, the expectation implemented? Because if we go back to our interface, I also have a method that calculates the expectation. So ex actually, expectation is just a different name for um, average. 
So let's have a look how this is implemented in our random variable that uses the floating point double array. So this is here. So he's calling this method get average, which is here on top. And you see that we are using Kahan summation. Yeah? So I use the numerical method that we had in our very first sessions on computer arithmetic to calculate here the sum yeah, to reduce the numerical error in this uh, summation. So we are summing here on a floating point double. So I take here the realization uh, and uh, yeah, do the error correction and then sum it. Let's have a look at the implementation that uses single precision floating point numbers. I also have an average function here, also calling get average. So you see it also is summing all these things up in the double precision uh, sum. Yeah? So it's just that you have single precision here, but the sum yeah, uses double precision floating point numbers and error correction and double precision floating point numbers. Yes, you already see from these little subtle things yeah, that there are many different ways how I can implement this. Yeah, and some are even a little bit better than others. Yeah? And also you see that now you have choices. You have choices on how, which implementation you use. So uh, is memory a problem in, in this model? Yeah? Should you reduce a little bit the memory usage? Then use maybe the single precision implementation yeah, of this random variable. The nice thing is that the code that uses this random variable just relies on the interface. It looks the same. This uh, technique of injecting in a different code, different implementations, is called dependency injection. So I have now a code that uses the random variable uh, to say, for example, value the uh, risk-neutral valuation of a European option under the Black Schultz model. And then I can inject different implementations of my random variable. I can maybe inject the sampling of the crown in increment using the floating point random variable or the uh, the single precision floating point random variable or the double precision floating point random variable. This technique is called dependency injection because you inject in this code the dependency on how this is done. Yeah? And you can change how different things inside your code are done by injecting different um, implementations. So examples for this with the random variable are the float and the double one. Uh, I also have a random variable that is implemented on uh, a GPU, uh, operations on a GPU. So, and um, another uh, thing which I have is a random variable that automatically performs algorithmic uh, differentiation. So for example, here in my uh, type hierarchy, you see there's random variable, but there's an additional random variable, random variable differentiable. So this interface has some additional uh, methods. It can calculate the gradient and the tangents. So it uses algorithmic differentiation, which is another numerical method. So it calculates the differentials while it's performing these operations. Yeah? And then you can inject an implementation of the random variable that automatically calculates the differentials while the calculations are done. So this technique is called uh, dependency injection, very powerful, and it heavily relies on using interfaces. So next thing on my list was the time discretization. So somewhere in my library, I have here below a package time and there is an interface time discretization. So time discretization, yeah, is just a collection of times. So I have a method that gives me how many time points do I have? How many time steps do I have? Number of time points minus one. 
give me the time for a given index, give me the time step for a given index, but I also have lookup functions. Yeah? If I have a given time, what is its index? So this will return a negative number if there is no such matching index and the negative number is then associated with the inser insertion point. Or if I have some time, uh, give me the time index that is the nearest one for the time being less or equal the given time. So this is effectively implementing here this method, implementing here this function. Uh, so my interface provides such a function. So whenever I use a time discretization, um, I have these handy functions. So here's an implementation of the time discretization. Yeah, it's just an array of these times. Yeah. Maybe the most convenient thing is that now the implementation allows me to construct the time discretization in different ways. Yeah. So you see, I have many different constructors here that allow me to construct the time discretization. And maybe this one is a very handy one. I specify the initial value the number of time steps and the time step size, and he will create the time discretization. Of course, it is just initial plus n times time step size. Okay, so now I have um, an interface for the time discretization and an implementation. So next thing on my list is the Brownian motion. Yeah, We have random variables, time discretization. So now I would like to create a Brownian motion where we often need the Brownian increment. So maybe my class should provide the Brownian increments. So where do we go now? So now we are here in Monte Carlo again, and you see there is an interface for the Brownian motion. So interface for the Brownian motion is just the function, give me the Brownian increment at a certain time index with a certain factor. Yeah? So going back, this is a function that gives you this mathematical object. Yeah, The i is the time index. The j is the factor. Yeah, so actually, as a mathematician, I started here in one, but the factor here starts in zero. Yeah? So the first one is W zero, W one, W two. Of course, you see here there's a time index. So the Brownian motion is associated with a time discretization. So it has to know its time discretization. So somewhere below here, you find give me the time discretization. And you see what we get back is the time discretization interface. Yeah? Could be different implementations of the time discretizations. And also here, what we get back by the Brownian increment is our random variable interface. So it could be that I have now a Brownian motion that generates the double precision random variables or that generates the floating, uh, the single precision random variables. Yeah? And then working with these random variables will either keep the double precision ones or generate the single precision ones. Uh, okay, by the way, you see this. If you go back to random variable, the, the single precision random variable, and look, for example, here at the method that adds to value, he will also generate as a result a single precision random variable. So if you have a Brownian motion that generates one of these two, yeah, and you use them further down the road, yeah, you will always be in this type of implementation of the random variable. So it knows the time discretization, but if it knows the time discretization, I could also provide um, for convenience a method that gives me the Brownian increment at a certain time, because then I just ask the time discretization, what is the corresponding time index? And I just call this method. You see that here I can implement something without actually knowing how this guy here is implemented. Yeah, I'm calling this method here. 
Yeah, but I just don't know how it is implemented. And I'm also calling here get time discretization, but I don't know which time discretization was used because this is just a specification of the interface. I can ask for the number of factors, yeah, and that's then my uh, Brown in motion. So let's look at some implementations. Yeah? So let's open the type hybrid key and you see there are are different ones, yeah, a Brown in motion from a mere Zen random number generator, a Brown in motion from a general random number generator. So maybe let's lose this general one. Yeah. So you know there is now my random number generator here, which is the interface we have already created before. Yeah? So now I use a random number generator as an interface. Yeah? So which random number generator enters here? Yeah? So this is a m-dimensional random number generator. Yeah? So this is an yeah, n-dimensional random number generator with a certain dimension that is used here. So I have a constructor I have a time discretization, the number of factor, the number of sample paths, the random number generator that should be used. And then I would like to have a way of creating the random variables. So there is this random variable factory here. The random variable factory just takes as an input the vector of samples and creates the corresponding random variable. It can create the single precision one, the double precision one. It can create also the algorithmic differentiation one. Okay, these are just the constructors and you see what I'm doing is I just store the arguments. I'm not creating the Brownian increment. So you find here another technique this technique is called lazy initialization. So I will not generate all these samples when you call the constructor. I will generate the samples late when you first need the Brownian increment. So just creating an SDE with the Brownian motion or just creating an Euler scheme with the Brownian motion, so just initializing the object doesn't cost any time. Yeah? A little, a little bit for storing these values, yeah, but no large amount of time for generating the random numbers, creating the inversion of the distribution function. So I have here an array Brownian increments. This array Brownian increments is an array of random variables with two indices, yeah, i, j, time index and factor, like I have here on my slide. So these are the two indices for every i and every j i have a random variable yeah when do we create this array of brown increments where we created the first time somebody is asking for a brown increment here's the implementation of get brown increment for a given time index and a given factor so i j so i first check is the error still null? Then generate the Brownian increments. If not, just return the corresponding object. So the work is done here in this do generate Brownian motion. And there you see that this is just how we generate a Brownian motion. Loop over all sample paths from our random number generator, get the vector then loop over all time steps. So calculate the square root of the time step size. So I'm actually pre-calculating this here. I use the time discretization to calculate here the square root of the time step size. So then we are here over all time steps. Then we are over all factors. Yeah. So take from your random number generator the uniform random number, apply the conversion to the standard normal using the inversion of the distribution function, multiply with the square root of the time step size, and that's your Brownian increment. 
So now I have an array of floating point numbers, yeah, and out of this array, now I create objects that are random variables. Uh, note that this code here could be used with a quasi-random number generator because you see that the dimension, the dimension of the random vector that is returned here is really number of time steps multiplied with number of factors. Yeah? So I'm I'm really looping here inside over all time steps and all factors. And this is then one sample path. Yeah, this is the dimension of the random number uh, generator. So you need a high, very high dimensional random number generator to populate this. In the case where you use a mere send Vista, I have an implementation here that is a little bit shorter where we just have the same method yeah, to generate Brown in motion, but I will use a mere send Twister. So there you see that we just loop over all sample paths, loop over all time steps, loop over all factors, ask the random number from the mass and twister and transform it to a standard normal, then multiply this square root of delta t. Yeah? So this is how we generate the Brown motion. So these were two implementations here of my Brown in motion interface. And you already see that there is some subtle stuff going on inside. Yeah, I use lazy initialization. So in, initialize the Brownian increment late. Yeah. Uh, I try to be uh, to be fast. Yeah, uh, I use the time discretization and so on. Okay, we are starting building up uh, our implementation hierarchy. Yeah, so we have discussed random variable time discretization brown in motion so the brown in motion also is an example for a dependency injection because you saw i have two different versions of how i implemented the brown in motions one just uses a mass and twister out of out of the box the other one can use a different random number generator like um, a halton uh, sequence. Yeah, I could create a brown motion out of a Halton sequence using this code, and then I could inject this brown in motion in my other code, the code that simulates the Black Scholes model using this brown these brown increments. And this code doesn't even know which random number generator was used to generate these samples. So that was here our little code review session. Yeah review the random variable and two different ways of implementing it, review the time discretization and a way of implementing it, yeah, so maybe not so many ways how to implement the time discretization. And we had the interface for a brown in motion and two different versions how we implement it. One a little bit more flexible. I already made the remark, I prefer to work with immutable objects. Yeah, So this is really something um, important. So immutable object, this means that once the object has been constructed, it is not allowed to change its state. So for example, my implementations of random variables, they are immutable. Yeah? So when you have a random variable x, if you like to, to multiply this random variable with, say, a constant, say, 2 here, yeah? then you get 2 times x. But this is not modifying x. Yeah? This does not mean that x is now twice the value of it was before, the pass-wise. Yeah? So this is not working. If you would like to have the result, actually, you need to assign the result to a new value. So you take your random variable x, you multiply it here with 2, and the result is then assigned to a new value z. This means x stays the same. Yeah, this is also important if you read the code. Yeah? So if you read the code and there's some x in the beginning, then something is done. Yeah? Uh, you can rely that the x is still the same, same, same thing. 
it looks a little bit as if this is inefficient, yeah, because I need to allocate additional memory for the result. But this is not true. Yeah, I did not make this experience uh, because the virtual machines are so massively optimized, yeah, that they reuse memory uh, for for the for the objects and they do not allocate memory again and again for this. The big benefit is that this is less error prone, um, especially if you consider working in situations where you have multiple threads that do something with this object. Yeah? So if something runs concurrently and does something with this object, it has to rely on the fact that this object is in a consistent state. So the state should not change. Uh, well, you maybe you think, okay, this is not completely true with the state. Yeah, uh, once the random variable has been constructed, the state should not change. For example, for my Brownian motion, this is not true because here the random variable is constructed, but I do not initialize this array, and this array is initialized at a later point in time. Yeah? So here, so here I am asking for this uh, Brownian increment, yeah? and I allocate the memory and I generate the numbers. But this object is, say, effectively immutable. So I do some internal changes, but from the outside, you cannot, uh, cannot observe that the state has changed, except that you may be observe that it requires a little bit of time yeah when you first call this function less time when you call the function the second time or that the memory requirements have changed but the values that are returned are still the same yeah so whenever you call, call give me the first Brownian increment for the first vector you get always the same random variable a small remark on the random variable with the filtration time yeah i just uh, already made this remark yeah, so we store here also the time, yeah, the time that is associated with this random variable, if this random variable is the result yeah, of discretizing a stochastic process. You also see this in our code for the Brownian motion. Yeah? You see that here in the code for the Brownian motion, when I create this random variable, I create it with the time. Uh, that is associated with the Brownian increment yeah, from our uh, time discretization. With respect to measurability, the Brownian increment from Ti to Ti plus 1, this is Fti plus 1 measurable. And so you see I'm associating it with the time at i plus 1. So this time here tells you a little bit the, about what is the measurability of this random variable? And since this time parameter is in the random variable, always carried over to the other ones. So for example, if you look in the random variable implementation here, in what happens if we add two random variables? Yeah. So if we add two random variables, the time that we will use is actually the maximum of the filtration times of the two random variables. So a small detail if, if you stumble over this time parameter here. So you can play a little bit with random variables. This is a very short experiment, random variable experiment. Yeah, let's have a look. This is here Monte Carlo and random variable in our lecture repository. Play a little bit with random variables. Yeah, so here you see I I create two random variables with just three sample values. Okay, uh, one using double precision, the other one using floating precision one, and then I'm performing some calculations. For example, calculate the expectation, calculate the expectation of x squared. You see that this here is everything is written in terms of the random variable. Yeah? So this code does not know, this code below does not know which implementation, so these two implementations, is injected into it. Yeah? And you can 
uh, observe a little bit the behavior of the random variable. You see, yeah, expectation is the same, but if you use the single position ones, yeah, there is yeah, a rounding error. So some results depend, of course, on the implementation details, but here this code does not depend on the implementation. This is dependency injection. So let me just conclude with now code session part two. So now I have here part two, and we will now make use of our time discretization of our random variables and our Brownian motion to so solve the problem from the beginning again, namely to implement here the evaluation of the European call option using the Black Scholes model. So I just move again to my little experiment here and we commented out this part of the code where we used the random variable. So let's have a look there. So now you see, what do we do? I generate my random number generator, which is my sent twister. I generate a time discretization, which has this initial time, number of time steps. Yeah? And the time step size is the capital T divided by the number of time steps. I generate my Brownian motion. So this is a problem in motion with this time discretization, one factor, number of sample paths, and use this random number generator. And then I ask it, give me the problem increment. So note, we are still here in this example, but now I'm a little bit more here. Yeah. So give me the problem increment. So from this, generate now the stochastic differential equation. So the drift is RT minus one half sigma squared capital T. The diffusion is my Brownian increment multiplied with sigma. So this is my sigma DW or sigma delta W. Okay. So now here I use the random variable, and I use multiply the random variable with a constant. And then my S is sigma times W of T plus the drift R, apply the exponential and multiply with the initial value. Yeah? So this here is S zero multiply with exponential of mu delta T plus sigma delta W of T, okay? Then I calculate the payoff function. So now take S, subtract the strike. So this is S minus K. Take the maximum of this and zero, take the floor and multiply with E to the R T. From that, sample vector take the expectation. So what do you see? You see that this loop over all sample paths, this is gone. And all the operations that we do here, these are now done on the random variables. And we can inject different ways of doing this by just changing the random variable factory that is used here inside this Brown in motion. Okay, I will discuss another version with you in the next session when we discuss how we will implement the Euler scheme. Yeah? Then we will have an Euler scheme here and we have everything hidden away in some implementations, but this will part, be part of the next session. Okay, so maybe now let's run this version that uses our random variable and probably in motion implementation. So first analytic value, Monte Carlo loop, then Java stream, then our random variable implementation. The random variable implementation produces the same value as the Java stream version because it also uses Kahan summation, but it's even a bit uh, faster. Yeah, that was it for today. Thanks.